Greetings. Welcome to the third meeting of the Education and Skills Committee in 2019. To remind everyone to turn their mobile phones and other devices to silent to uh, prevent them interfering with the broadcasting. Today we have received apologies from Dr Alistair Allen and um, Gil Patterson is attending his as a substitute today, so we're welcome to Mr Patterson. Um, the first item of business is a discussion on whether to take consideration of a work programme in private at the next meeting. Are members content to do so? Thank you. Agenda item two is um, the Scottish National Standardised Assessments Inquiry, and this is the second week of the committee inquiry. I would like to welcome to the committee this morning uh, Dr Keir Bloomer, Convener of the Education Committee of the Royal Society of Edinburgh, Professor Louise Hayward, Professor of Education Assessment and Innovation, College of Social Sciences, School of Education, University of Glasgow, and Professor Lindsay Patterson, Professor of Education Policy, School of Social and Political Science, University of Edinburgh. And thank you all for coming along to um, uh, participate this morning. Um, can I just open by asking a very, uh, ask you to, to briefly set out um, your own perspectives in relation to the SNSAs? and the move away from SSLN. And if I could start with um, Dr. Bromer. Much. Good morning, everyone. Um, the position of the Royal Society of Edinburgh is that it has no objection in principle to the idea of standardised testing. It is concerned about the fact that we have, if anything, too little information and data about how the education system in Scotland operates, particularly in the whole of the primary phase and the early part of the secondary phase. So the idea of gaining more information through the introduction of these assessments is one that, broadly speaking, the uh, Royal Society of Edinburgh would welcome, which is not necessarily to say that it welcomes every aspect of what has subsequently uh, taken place, but the principle, as far as we are concerned, uh, is perfectly all right. Our major concern, I think, with what has happened is that the purpose of the assessments has become less certain as time has passed. We were fairly clear at the outset that the main purpose was about monitoring performance of the system, and that, as I say, is something that we would welcome. Uh, since then, the emphasis has been placed upon the diagnostic capacity of the tests and therefore their ability to help teachers help individual pupils. And I know you wanted to be brief at the outset, so I won't go into the detail of this at the moment, but we are much less persuaded that the tests work effectively in that role. Um, so there are concerns about the way in which uh, they are being used at the present moment. But we think that the tests have the capacity to supply information which is of value and which has not been available hitherto. You also asked about uh, SSLN, and uh, we are puzzled about the abandonment of SSLN. Um, we think it is unfortunate that there has been no continuity in the kind of information that has been made available in the past. We had a previous kind of assessment, SSA, which ran for, I think, five years, a uh, short interval, SSLN, which ran for six years, abandonment, and now we have um, a, a third system. We think that the idea of a, a sample survey, which is what SSLN was, is not incompatible with universal assessment of the kind that um, uh, the new SNSAs provide. We do not see what the rationale for abandoning it was. It would be perfectly possible to run both systems in parallel. Okay, thank you. Um, Professor Howard? Hayward, sorry. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Um, I think that um, it's very important to set, say at the outset that um, it, it's important to remember that both the SNSA and um, the survey are simply different ways of collecting evidence and that both of these sit within the National Improvement Framework. So when looking at any part of the, the system, it's important to see that in the context of the whole. Um, uh, tests and surveys are simply different ways of collecting evidence. The really important thing is the purpose, and that um, different ways of collecting evidence um, relate most effectively to different purposes. 
So once um, there's clarity about the purpose, then um, it, it, the second order question is, once we, want, once we know what, what it is that we want to find out, then what are the best ways of, of finding that out? And so I think um, it's an encouragement to come back to what really are the central purposes. Um, the idea of having um, information from um, tests that supports teachers' professional judgment um, is an entirely appropriate um, approach. The issue is, though, that we have to decide what matters, and if what matters is curriculum for excellence, then our assessment system should reflect all that matters in curriculum for excellence. And we have to find ways of gauging how much and how well children are learning in relation to all of these processes. The move from the survey, um, that I think surveys um, can provide very helpful information if the purpose of the information is to give um, feedback at a national level on how the system is progressing, then I think that survey evidence is a very good way of doing that because it can provide evidence at that national level without having some of the un unintended consequences that other ways of collecting evidence can have on either narrowing the curriculum or encouraging teachers to teach to particular parts of, of that curriculum. So central focus is purpose and then decide how best to collect information. Thank you. Um, Professor Lindsay? Thank you for the invitation Patterson, this morning. Sorry, um, thank I, you. I, 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 I can't see the names yes. because they, they're sitting worry. below the level of the wood. Sorry. No problem. Um, yeah, I think that collecting data that is neutral and reliable is always better than not having it. And the new tests, assessments as we're supposed to call them, whatever their faults may be, are more reliable and more neutral, more objective, more independent of bias than anything we've ever had before in recent decades in Scottish education. And the reason I say that is that all of us who teach, and I include here university teachers as much as any other sector of schooling, are unavoidably subject to bias. Sometimes that is unconscious bias. We know, for example, that if you don't allow students' essays to be marked anonymously, then there will be bias against, for example, women. Women underperform, or rather they are more accurately assessed when they are assessed anonymously. So that is an illustration of the kind of bias that all teachers inevitably have. And the bias of school teachers, which is no less than, but no greater than that of university teachers, I should emphasize, is evident from the previous survey, the Scottish Survey of Achievement, where it was systematically shown year after year after year that when teachers assessed children, they tended towards optimism, sometimes really very great optimism compared with the results of objective tests conducted in the survey. So that, for me, is the principal attraction of the new Scottish standardised assessments, which is they provide neutral, objective information, which guards against bias. And we know from the history of examinations that guarding against bias in that way has been one of the major means by which equality of opportunity has been improved, for example, for women in Scotland, for Catholics, for ethnic minorities uh, more recently. Uh, secondly, as far as the abandonment of the survey is concerned, I completely agree with what's been said. The two could have run in parallel. And the great advantage of a survey is it can ask a much wider range of information and much deeper kinds of information. And incidentally, I do agree uh, that the survey as designed, that's the Scottish Survey of Literacy and Numeracy, was not adequate for some of these purposes. The older one, the Scottish Survey Achievement, was actually better. And one of the ways in which it was better is not only that surveys can provide a national picture, as has already been said, but in reply to the Cabinet Secretary's um, a legitimate complaint that the SSLN could not not tell you where things were happening, where things were getting better or getting worse. That was a feature of the design of the SSLN and was not a, concept, not a feature of the design of the SSA, where the design allowed you in, in, anonymously to say that school was doing better and it was doing better perhaps for these reasons to do with same homework practice or discipline or school uniform or something. It is possible to design a survey, in other words, that both gives you a national picture and also gives you not only a local council level picture but also a school picture. So both could be done. Thank you. I'm going to move to um, questions from the committee members, and I'll, I'll ask Mr Scott. Thank you. Maybe I could just start with this purpose point. Um, in your submission, Professor Hayward, you say, um, it's good, and it's a really helpful submission, and I'm grateful for it, that there are three main purposes, sorry, these three main purposes interact in any national assessment system. Any action taken in one area will have an impact on the others. You said earlier on there wasn't clarity at the moment on the well, the purpose of this, of the standardised assessments, do you think there needs to be, and what should it be? I think, 
I would argue now, I think, that there is greater clarity in that um, the, 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 the national assessments are there to um, provide one part of the information profile on an individual child. Um, you know, Lindsay pointed to the advantage of um, the, 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 the items in a survey in terms of the reliability. Mm. The issue, of course, is that the, the danger then is that that compromises in terms of validity. So the issue that um, the, the tests, these assessments, um, are only able to um, give information on certain aspects of the curriculum. Um, and although they um, give information on important aspects of the curriculum, it isn't all the curriculum. So, for example, if you might get information on um, punctuation or on spelling, um, but writing is more than that. And so there really, uh, I think, is that the, the way that we get information on what matters is to uh, do what is central to um, Scottish policy in this area, which is that we have to depend on teachers' professional judgment, because it's the teachers who work day-to-day -day with the young people, they're the ones who, who collect the information, and the system should support teachers in order that we can build and enhance um, the dependability of that professional judgment. So there are more than one. There is more than one purpose. It's not just about te uh, supporting teacher judgment. It's about the whole school system and understanding what that uh, is doing or how it is performing. So there's at least two purposes. Am I? F is that fair? There are there are three main purposes, um, and um, it's recognising the fact that no one part of the the process will be able to address all of these purposes. That's why we have a national improvement framework that draws evidence from a range of sources linked to a range of different purposes. And does the panel believe that having three purposes or, uh, is appropriate? I think it could lead to confusion mm -hmm. in the absence of any other source of information of the kinds that we've already referred to in the case of surveys. Um, it, it would be possible to design what would unfortunately therefore be a very cumbersome system where all the SNSA results were supplemented by the full range of kinds of information that you might collect in a well-designed survey. But that would impose such burdens on teachers and schools as to make it unmanageable, I think. For example, it would mean, um, well, let's take a specific example here. It's already through the school census known um, from returns that the schools give what the home lang language of the child is. Now, that's quite a, a difficult thing for the school already to establish. If, in addition, they had to establish, for example, the education level of the parents, perhaps the occupation that the parents worked in, even such matters to do with the size of the family, the living arrangements, you know, was it a sing single parent family or whatever, these kind of things would just, that's not what schools are for. It would be a ridiculous amount of burden. And that's why sample surveys can give you deeper information. So although, in principle, you could design a SNSA type thing that would cover all the purposes, I don't think, in practice, you can. No. That, that wasn't what I was. That Indeed. wasn't what I was saying. No, no, I quite understand yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So, so it's the. Uh, in your view, is that government needs to concentrate all oh, those who are promoting the the um, best uh, motive behind standardised assessments needs to be very clear about what the purpose is. Do you think that's been established? I mean, Keir Bloomer, you've suggested that it had changed in your opening remarks. Yeah. This is, has clearly changed. Yeah. It was on national monitoring at the outset and it is now more on the diagnostic capability um, and I think one has to recognise that the uh, diagnostic value of the tests is limited. There are some strengths in it. Uh, it can monitor the same pupils over time, for example, which is not something that we were able to do yeah. through the sample surveys yeah. because yeah. the same pupils didn't figure in successive runs of the, uh, uh, of the, of the survey. We now have what uh, are being described as long scales, which stretch through from primary one to secondary three, uh, and it is possible to monitor how the individual pupil has progressed up the scale. And I think that is val valuable information. I think researchers will be able to make uh, something of it in the, uh, in the future. On the other hand, the um, assessment looks at a restricted area of the curriculum once every three years. So as far as, far as the individual is concerned, that's a minimal amount 
uh, of information that is going to be available uh, at any given time. And although the information that is uh, available in the printout uh, has more value than I think has been given credit for, and of course is available or is to be available uh, to parents as well as to teachers, um, it is still restricted. It's a standard description of what performing at band six means, for example, and not very much more than that. Uh, there's another issue which some teachers have raised with me as a source of difficulty. Um, one of the features of the assessment is that it's adaptive. So as the uh, child goes through it, uh, depending on how he or she is getting on, they will be fed more difficult or less difficult questions. Uh, so in order to be able to, uh, as a teacher, work out what the outcome of the assessment is saying about the child, you really need to be able to follow their path through the questions. And that is not too easy to do in the feedback. And there is also the issue that you can clearly get to the same banding as a result of going through different paths. So I think that different interpretations might attach to that. So there are, there are I think, some complications in the, in the nature of the feedback. Um, and for a teacher, it would be necessary to be aware of what the strengths and weaknesses of the assessment were in order to try and get what is of value out of it. Yeah, thank you. That, I think that's very effective. The other question I was just going to ask again to Professor Hayward is you, you've, you've done some international comparative work, which again has been supplied to the committee and it's really helpful. Just on P1 testing, I can't find, and correct me if I'm wrong, any other country in your, in your international comparatives who does P1 testing. Do you, am, am I missing something about how other educational systems around the world look at what's happening or, or assess how children aged four and five are doing? I'm not sure that the, the, the question was asked. Um, okay. So I think that we may not have the, For, the, the, the evidence. Yeah. But um, you know, there, there certainly are countries who would um, use tests. Um, but even at that young age, um, at the early stage of school? At a young age, but they're, they're, they would be few in number, mm -hmm. and they would tend to be countries where um, there was a strong tradition of testing um, through their, their system. Yeah. But certainly I think the, the again, it's back to the, the purpose is important. It is important, mm. it's really important to um, know what young people are able to, what, the, what they bring Mm -hmm. um, what they're able to do, what they know, what they understand, how they feel about learning. Mm -hmm. you know, these are all really important um, aspects of... So gathering information about young people as they come into the system is, is really important. Um, and how best to do that is a matter for debate. Mm -hmm. OK, thank you. Professor yeah. Patterson, yeah. you wanted to... The Netherlands does test from the beginning. Um, I get this from the OECD report on testing in the Netherlands in 2014. It goes right through from years one to years eight and year one is aged five-ish, so it's much the same as here. Um, the test in year one and two, um, elementary mathematical things as we call it, ordering, language, and orientation in space and time. So it is possible to do it. I remind you that the Netherlands is a very high-performing country in the PISA test, for example. Um, and also, um, the arguments about play-based learning, which we may come on to later on, are never just confined to age five. They're usually thought of as the relating to the whole period up to about age seven and from about age three to age seven. And if you include that range, then there are many countries that start testing at the equivalent of either our P2 or our P3, depending on whether they start at age five or age six. So, for example, Denmark does the same, Australia does the same. So it's not, it is unusual, I agree, more, more common than not, not to start until about age eight, but nevertheless, there are perfectly respectable countries that we like to emulate and are in many respects doing better than us that do start from an early age. Thank you. Can I just ask one final question on purpose, Dr. Patterson? Just, uh, do you think ultimately will, if testing stays the same, and there'll be some argument for continuity, given how much we chop and change and yes. have done in Scotland, um, if, if testing were to remain the same, how long would it take Scotland to work out what was genuinely happening in our schools? That point you made at the, in your opening yes. remarks about the whole school experience, how yes. long would it take us to know... Well, I would give the same answer to any question about any educational reform of any kind whatsoever, at least a decade. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Gray. Thank you, convener. I had um, some specific questions of clarification for each of the panels, so 
Um, I, I, I hope that's okay. My first really was for Dr. Bloomer. Um, um, and it's a, a follow-up, or the first part of this, I think, is a follow-up to one of Mr. Scott's questions or your answer uh, to him, Dr. Bloomer. So you said that you felt that um, the purpose of the test was not clear when they were first proposed. Um, the emphasis seemed to be on getting a national picture, but latterly the emphasis has been much more on diagnostic use of the SNSAs, by, by which I presume you mean teachers using that information to plan the individual learning and teaching strategy for that pupil. But in your answer to Mr. Scott, you rather implied, I think, that you feel, or the RSE feel, that these tests are not particularly effective uh, for that purpose. Is that, is that fair? Not entirely. I think that they have strengths and weaknesses. I said, for example, that the ability to track the same pupil over time is a strength, sure. and it's not a strength that we have had in the past. Uh, I think the amount of feedback in relation to the individual from any one test is quite limited, and that obviously uh, is a weakness. Um, there's also a need for teachers to become skilled users of the information that is available, and of course there has been um, some degree of professional development made available with that purpose in mind. Um, but my overall conclusion on it is that um, it is not a form of assessment which yields a wide range of valuable information. It, it, it's not without value, but it, it's, a, it, it's limited. Okay. Um, with regard to the, the other purpose, the um, getting a national picture, um, the, the core um, objective uh, of the government, stated objective of the government, is to close the attainment gap. Um, and I, you made an interesting point, and I wondered if you wanted to elaborate on that, that the uh, SSLN previously was applied across all schools in Scotland, but SNSA uh, does not take place in the independent sector. And I just wondered um, if you wanted to elaborate the impact then on the measurement of the, the attainment gap, if that's the case. Well, that does seem to me to be a matter that's relevant to the attainment uh, gap. Um, and I don't suppose there is any um, reason in principle why uh, the new national assessment should not uh, take place in independent schools of law, whether the government could or would wish to uh, oblige independent schools to make use of them is obviously another matter. But it is a dimension that was present in SSLN and is absent now. And also, of course, SSLN had information about family background um, and it surveyed teacher views as well. Uh, so there was a richness to the information about SSLN, although I accept the point that Lindsay made earlier on that probably SSA, its predecessor, was a better test still than SSLN. But we have lost quite a lot of that contextual information. And, of course, it is very valuable in relation to trying to um, narrow the attainment gap. But we've also removed from the data a cohort which, in general terms, would likely to be at the more privileged end of the, the spectrum. Is that correct? Ab absolutely, yeah. yes. OK. Um, I had a question for Professor Hayward. Professor Hayward, um, a lot of the impetus for this change, as the Cabinet Secretary in particular describes it, comes from the OECD report and some of the things they said. Uh, about the availability of data in the Scottish education system. Uh, but in the Glasgow University paper, uh, you say, or the university says, that this is based on a misinterpretation of the recommendation of the OECD report, um, specifically the shift away from the, um, the sample approach. is based on a misinterpretation of the report, and I just wondered if you could enlarge a little on that. I think that um, the, no, no one voice ever influences uh, a shift in policy direction. Uh, the, the core evidence which is presented to us 
This is the only evidence, I think, presented to us and to Parliament as a, an evidential research reason for making this change. So in this case, it is. The, if you, I, I included the quote from the OECD report sure. within the report that um, I submitted. And they are clear that th th they're saying that um, this does not mean that by necessity one particular path must be, be followed. So it was open, therefore, for a broader debate to, to think round the, 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 the issues. Um, in terms of the, um, the I, it, it's back to purpose. It's, it, it's around what is it that um, people want to know um, and what use are they going to make of the evidence? You know, data makes it sound very, very hard and, and, and impersonal. And there, there's an advantage in having a degree of, of objectivity. But on the other hand, the, the, the central purpose in all of this has to be improving children's life experiences. And so it's the way in which we collect evidence. And that evidence, um, who's going to use the evidence and for what purpose? You know, that um, you, don't, um, you don't grow flowers by weighing them. You know, you grow flowers by creating the circumstances in which um, they, they develop and you feed them and you, you look after them and, and you help them to grow. So improving, I mean, closing the attainment gap is a kind of shorthand, I guess, for improving the life chances of all young people in Scotland. And then within that, then we have to ask ourselves very serious questions about how best we're going to do that. Um, and the focus, therefore, has to be on the action that is taken in relation to the evidence we have, rather than having all our attention on the evidence. And the second issue is that in my submission, I, I listed all of the areas where evidence is collected. So there's a sense in which that um, our system has to operate at all levels. Um, and there's certain information that um, national policymakers need in order to think about future policy development. So the action they will take in order to, to enhance the direction of policy um, but do they need all of the evidence do they need all of the information right the way through the system or is it the teacher in the classroom who needs evidence about every individual child and then perhaps the the, the head teacher in the school who needs evidence about the dependability of the professional judgment of every teacher in that school the local authority needs information. So it, it's a, a layered model. Um, and all of these different layers have to work in order for the system to, to operate effectively. Because otherwise, we move into a world where we collect so much information that actually we can't, we can't make use of it. So, so this is why then, um, in your evidence, you say, a view emerged that the OECD had recommended the introduction of standardised assessment. Uh, and that's a misinterpretation of the recommendation, which was much broader in the terms that you've just described. Is that fair? I think that's, that's fair, but I think the OECD also um, uh, argued that um, we should look at the range of sources of evidence that we had available sure. yeah. and then relate these back to the purposes that we intended them to serve. Thanks. Thanks very much. It's very helpful. Um, Professor Patterson, I, I, I wanted to ask you um, not so much about your evidence, but about some previous comments that, that you've made with regard to the introduction of SNSA. Back in 2017, uh, when the policy was uh, first being described, uh, you said that the very local approaches to SNSAs cannot give a valid national picture, uh, and that therefore the whole exercise is a waste of time, quite strong, quite strong words. And uh, as recently as this time last year, um, you said that Scotland has no reliable method of monitoring the performance of schools and literacy and numeracy uh, for the first time in almost 60 years, a situation you described as woefully inadequate. Those, those are quite strong words, uh, stronger perhaps than the evidence you've given this morning. And I just wondered if you uh, still uh, hold 
these to be these views to be correct. I'm being diplomatic in my submission to Thank the committee. You. <laughs> um, yes, I do. And if we take the second of the two things first, um, that's the, the situation so far as evidence is concerned. What I was referring to in that quote, quotation comes from a context in which I was discussing the demise of all, almost all surveys of school students and school leavers of any other group. The only one we have left is PISA, and it's inadequate for most purposes. It's age 15 only, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, we, and I say 60 years because Scotland, in fact, we could even go back and say nearly um, 80 years because Scotland pioneered the use of good quality surveys to understand the progress of people through education systems. And from that came a whole series of things, the Scottish School Labour Survey, the various surveys of primary school children, the SSLN, the SSA, predecessors to that, the Assessment of Achievement Programme and various other things. All of these things have gone. They're no longer there. And so the kinds of information that we had, for example, 20 years ago when the Parliament was established, we simply don't have now. We cannot monitor. It is impossible at present, for example, to know reliably whether we are actually closing the attainment gap. We cannot know that because we don't collect valid data. The thing about SIMD, you know, the area thing, is just not valid as a measure of social inequality. So that, I hold strongly to that. And um, I suppose I do feel strongly about it because that's my job is to, is to do research. So perhaps you can discount my strength of feeling because I lack opportunities to do research. Um, on the first thing, which is about the, um, the, the, the use of the proposed SN. SAs. Um, I think the question is still very much open. I have been somewhat reassured by the approach taken by ASA, the, the contractors doing the surveys, the, the details, the rigour of their approach as submitted um, to this committee and also as in the first annual report from them and also as in information from Freedom of Information requests that I, Reform Scotland kindly helped me to get. I do think they are trying to produce standard, reliable information that can be interpreted in the same way across the whole of Scotland. But there are still major worries. One of the really major worries is not knowing when the child is tested. And if you take a child in primary one, the difference between being tested, say, in when they just arrive in primary one in September and being tested just before they leave in June is, is, is clearly about uh, one sixth of the child's development up to that point. That's an enormous amount of child development at such a young age. Now, we could allow for that statistically um, in, in, in appropriately technical ways if we knew when they were tested. But the information about when they're tested, as far as I understand it, is not to be collected. Maybe I'm wrong there, and I hope I'm wrong. And it would have to be there at least to be able to be able to make use of the kinds of um, uh, standardisation of the test results that would be needed in order to make sense of that at a national level. There are other ways in which the circumstances, we don't necessarily know um, the circumstances under which the testing takes place. Some schools are doing it um, all at the same time, almost like an exam. The IS has pointed out. Others are doing it much more informally. Um, I have heard of many schools through, through teachers and parents uh, where the, it's essentially just integrated into the classroom environment. Now, it, a, a scientific study that, that, that w was aware of that kind of variation would want to collect that information about the context, the conditions under which the testing was taking place. So it can be done, it can be standardised. So my comment originally may be wrong, but at the moment I would still be somewhat pessimistic about that. So, so if the, um, we have no reliable method of monitoring the performance of schools nationally, yes. what about the other purpose that we've talked about this morning, the diagnostic purpose and yes. the individual learning strategies? How do you feel about the strength of well, the SNSAs for sorry. that? Yeah. Yes, I agree the, there are problems that, that have been identified already, but I do think one valuable way in which it could contribute to that is, is, is through what we might call calibrating teacher judgments. I referred earlier to the unavoidable bias that we all have as teachers. But one of the ways we can try to improve that, that is to correct for our bias, is to keep looking at objective data um, and comparing our judgments with the results of the objective data. And that can lead us to improve our judgments. That's what other professionals do all the time, and it's something that I think we should do as, as teachers. Uh, so in that sense, I think that the measures, although only measuring part of what a child can do, are actually quite valuable. And of course, you find that good secondary schools are doing that all the time every year when the SQA exam results come in. Uh, they sit down and look at the results and they compare them with the forecasts they made for each individual student taking these exams and they try to improve their forecasts and indeed also in turn improve their teaching. So that's the way I hope that the tests will be used uh, but at the moment it's not clear that they are going to be integrated into programmes of teacher development in the thorough way that would be required to achieve that. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Mr Greer. Okay. Professor Hayward, in your very useful submission, your uh, referencing the, the three main purposes of uh, assessment, you mentioned uh, holding people to account to be one of them. Um, could you detail a little bit on how the SNAs, uh, SNSAs do that? And uh, if you forgive a daft laddie question for me, uh, who is it the SNSAs are holding to account? 
I think that um, I said what I intended to say was that any system um, has a range of um, purpose, serves a range of purposes. Um, and in, just now in Scotland, um, the, the, the national level data, which I guess is about, is the system performing as well as um, we would like it to, then the evidence that's available for that is through the National Improvement Framework. The issue about um, putting too much um, um, emphasis on something like SNSA is, to go back to something that I said earlier, is that what, that what it looks at is very narrow in compared to, you know, Curriculum for Excellence um, is, with its four purposes, um, is the vision of what it is to be an educated Scot. We want people to be successful learners, and we want to, to be able to contribute, you know, all, all of these, these parts. And what the SSNA will, will give us information on, it will give us reliable information on a, a very small part of two areas of our broad curriculum. And so to then say that from these two very small areas of the curriculum, we can then generalize to the education system as a whole, um, I, I think um, would lead us to ask questions. So it's about um, being very clear about the purpose if we want to ask questions about how much and how well um, young people are developing, then we have to do that across the curriculum. And the only way we can do that um, is by um, having, uh, basing these um, reflections on the evidence that we get from teachers' dependable judgment. And over time, we have to work to make sure that that uh, judgment becomes more and more dependable. But there are other ways, other than testing, that that is done in Scotland. So for example, um, bodies like Education Scotland um, have professional moderation activities, where just as um, uh, Lindsay was describing with SQA, that teachers will come together, they will look at examples of pupils' work, they will share their understandings of it, they will look at that against the, the national benchmarks, and they will develop an understanding um, that will inform their professional judgment so that we can build um, professional judgment that is um, more consistent um, across every school in the country. There is no system that's perfect. You know, we look for um, developing approaches um, that will give us sufficiently dependable information that, that will allow good quality action to be taken in order to support young people's learning. Thank you. That, that was useful. I suppose what I'm getting at is the, the concern that the teaching unions have, have raised, that, or that a number of individual teachers have raised, that SNSA uh, data may be used to judge their performance. Is there an appropriate use of that? Should that be used as um, evidence of uh, a, a teacher's performance by a head teacher or a local authority, for example, given that class level data can be aggregated? Um, no, is the, the short answer to that. Um, it, it's, again, it's back to, assessment basically is very simple. There are, there are two ways that you, two world views you can have of assessment. You can have a world view that says assessment is about um, ways of um, gathering evidence to inform learning. So the focus is on learning and improving learning. Or you can have a world view of assessment which says it's about judgment and it's about um, categorization and it's about. So, and these two worldviews sit uneasily together. Now, in the real world, they mesh to a certain extent, but the focus ultimately has to be on learning. If it's on judgment, um, then we get into all kinds of perverse behaviours. So that um, if, if teachers believe that um, the, they are going to be judged by um, evidence coming from one, it one area, so one test, then they will naturally teach to that test and they will spend more time on, on 
on, on these parts of the curriculum. Um, so the, 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 the assessment, this um, standardised assessment, uh, gives teachers one important source of evidence that they can use to inform what action they take in order to support children's learning, but it is only in a small number of areas. And we would not want tests that covered our, our, our standardised assessments, that covered all of the areas of the curriculum, because then we would do nothing else. The focus has to be on learning, not on assessment. Thank you. Ms. Goldruth? A, a brief supplementary to Ross Greer's line of questioning. Um, I was quite taken, uh, Professor Hayward, with your uh, comments with regard to assessment being, you know, learning has to be the principal concern of what we're doing here. Um, and I would be interested to hear the, the panel's views with regard to what happened previously under the SSLN and whether or not learning was a principal concern of that survey. Will I start? Do you want to start? Yeah, go ahead. I mean, yes, I mean, the, I, I would agree um, completely that um, the, the SSE, the, the Scottish Survey of Achievement, um, was um, a better survey than SSLN. Um, by sorry. context, by way of background, um, I was a teacher previously and had children removed from my classes, sample, sample sizes, um, as was the case previously, um, who would be removed from class and then that data was never shared with me as a classroom teacher. So I think there is a disconnect um, more generally in the, in the teaching profession because data in the past used to be held in the hands of uh, teachers, uh, deputy heads, and it, was not, you know, it wasn't used to empower the profession. And I see there's a bit of a disconnect here with what happened previously and what we're, we're seeking to achieve with SNSAs. Uh, and I do feel that, you know, from my own experience at the SSLN, did not empower the teaching profession, and I'd be interested to hear the panel's views on that. I think that SS, as part of SSE and SSLN, then um, these were um, the, the items within these um, tests were designed by teachers, so that there were teachers across the country who were part of the construction of these. Um, there were also there were there were courses that were run that um, were designed to um, help people use the information that came from SSLN. But I think you put your finger absolutely on the, the, the crucial issue, which is that um, it was partial. So some people had access and others didn't. And that simply isn't, isn't good enough. I used to tease a bit and that if we had called SSA rather than the Scottish Survey of Achievement, if we'd called it Save Scotland from Accountability, mm -hmm. then it would have attracted a great deal more interest than... But the issue is, is absolutely crucial. We have to be clear about the purpose. And certainly an information from surveys um, can feed back into, uh, to provide very helpful information for classroom teachers. But if it doesn't do that, then, then we're missing a, a significant opportunity. I think the other thing, sorry, one other thing that was really interesting, sorry, about, Go ahead. about <laughs> you can tell I'm excited about this, about um, SSE was the fact that um, in addition to the, the, the national survey, then um, local authorities had an opportunity to ask um, for a boosted sample within a particular local authority, which would then give them information at a local authority level. And technically, there would be nothing to suggest that, for example, a head teacher did not take items from a survey to use within a school or for a teacher within a classroom to give that same kind of, of information. Um, I do notice that um, the, with S, the SSNE now that um, the norming, stu norming studies give the opportunity to develop um, a survey approach, which again could take some of the the advantages that I've described there and build them into our system, if that is our purpose. Um, the, the reason that you, as a teacher, no teacher would have been given the results of the individual children assessed in the survey is exactly the same reason as all survey responses are confidential uh, by the normal ethical requirements of any survey. If I were to do a survey of people and then to give to anyone apart from the respondent the, the responses that they gave, I would be I would be severely disciplined and ultimately could be sacked by the university. So that's an absolutely fundamental principle of surveys, is that only the survey contractor 
sworn to confidentiality and the individual respondent knows what the individual respondent has done or replied to that survey. Um, now, the reason why local authorities could get access to their level of information in the SSA, as they can, for example, to the Scottish Household Survey, is because the level of aggregation there, the number of people involved in the sample at the local authority level, is such that there is no risk of any individual, individual identity being compromised. Um, I doubt if that could be done at the level of the school, and it certainly couldn't be done at the level of the classroom. Um, now, that might be argued as an advantage of the SNSA, because they can be, the whole contractual situation is different there. It's intended that the teacher knows what the results of the individual child's uh, tests are, and that's the whole design, so nobody's in any doubt about that. But a survey should not and cannot do that kind of thing. Um, and I think more positively, however, you might ask then, how would the survey um, be useful to teachers? Well, there's two ways. Louise has already mentioned one, which is about the overall national report. It was useful to teachers in the same way it was useful to to, to government and politicians and so on and, and other people as well. But there's another specific way, which actually is a good thing about the SSLN that developed after the SSA, which was that the people running the SSLN would pick out those test items which children weren't doing very well in and use them as the basis of professional development sessions for teachers. Now, that's an extremely good practice. And so they would find, for example, that children were not very good at telling the time. And so they would then uh, use the, the, the kinds of mistakes that children made in the telling the time questions to then advise teachers on how better to teach time. Um, and that, that was a great idea, and it shows how a survey can be used, of course, totally anonymously, because that was aggregated uh, across the whole of the, of the country. It wasn't about children in that person's classroom, it was about the whole of um, Scotland. So a survey can be used in that way, but a survey cannot address the kinds of questions that individual testing of individual children can do. That's not the purpose of a survey. Okay. Okay. Dr. Okay. Bloomer, did it's you want... mistake yes. to mm. assume that... Uh, a survey or come to that a system of universal assessment that says something about how the system as a whole in, is performing has nothing to do with learning. You know, learning in the system will improve if we know more about how we're doing and whether we are progressing or moving backwards. So although the connection is less direct than in the case of the feedback given to the teacher about the individual's performance, uh, survey information of this kind is still a valuable contribution towards um, improvement. And there is a kind of orthodoxy in Scottish education at the present moment that nothing influences the quality of provision other than the quality of teaching. That is not true. There are lots of other factors, such as the curriculum, such as the nature of educational policy, that uh, influence the way in which the system is performing and therefore what the experience of the individual actually is. And we therefore require to have that kind of information. So these uh, sample surveys, which we used to have, fulfilled a very important function. And it's not clear that any longer we have that kind of information available at any rate in the sort of depth that, uh, that we had before. Um, I mean, in a couple of years' time, uh, all of you will be expressing vocally views about whether or not the attainment gap has, uh, has narrowed. Um, it's probably possible to predict uh, each individual's views on this matter. Um, but you will be resting what you say on remarkably thin evidence at the present moment. Thank you. Um, Mr Mandel? Thank you, uh, convener. Um, it sort of leads on uh, from that point, but I also want to go back, uh, Dr Bloomer, to some of your, your previous comments about uh, the adaptive nature of the test and some of the feedback that, that, that you've received. Because I just wonder myself, you know, once you, you look at the adaptive element, uh, some of the accessibility features that have been built in the variable time scale that an individual can spend completing the test, uh, the different uh, testing circumstances, uh, the different timescales for carrying out the tests. Uh, you know, with, with, with all those variables built in, you know, do, do you think that we can look at them as being standardised at all? Clearly, they are not fully standardised. Lindsay has talked about um, the issue of timing. I think it's, it is relatively common for schools to have um, a set pattern of, of timing. For example, one that I visited recently, uh, last year had carried out almost all of its testing in May, 
and had come to the conclusion, which I think is perfectly reasonable, that uh, a primary school will get little value out of testing primary seven pupils in May. They haven't got the opportunity to make uh, any use of the feedback that they get. So they had come to the conclusion that they would carry out the tests on all primary seven pupils in November. Um, you can see the reason for that, but it, if that is a common phenomenon, and I think it is a relatively common phenomenon, then it sits ill with the idea that every pupil is being tested at the point where they're judged by the teacher to be ready. So there are a whole lot of circumstances like that which mean that the, the circumstances of testing for the individual are likely to vary quite widely across Scotland. And yes, that clearly does have an effect on the overall outcomes and whether you can fairly compare what is happening in one place with another. Not that you have the opportunity to make that comparison anyway, but even if you had, uh, I think that the, those kind of variations would make it less than valid. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that. Um, I, I also um, wondered uh, whether or not uh, you, you felt it was odd uh, not to have sort of road tested some of some of the testing models uh, with, with teachers. We were hearing uh, last week that, that teachers were only sort of consulted sort of in passing in the design of the test, particularly um, at, at, at primary one level. And do you think that if, if the tests are designed to, to help assist with teacher judgment that you would have expected the teachers would have been, been asked about the, the tests before they were implemented? Well, an initial point if I may on teacher judgment. Um, one effect of the tests is that they may assist teachers in relating their own judgment to national expectations and standards. Um, and that is in itself quite helpful. Um, the tests were the subject of some road testing before. Whether that uh, is, um, was done to an adequate extent or not, I wouldn't really like to uh, offer you a view. There's always a tension in policy making and implementation between taking your time to get it right and getting on with the job. And I think that, if anything, uh, the tendency in recent years has been to accelerate timescales, and that means that, that less is done in order to um, try and perfect the instrument before, before you start off. But to be fair, that is not a criticism which I have heard much canvassed by teachers. OK, thank you. Um, Professor Patterson, I wondered if I could uh, come to the points you've made um, about teacher uh, judgment. Um, other people might not see it that way, but I, I, I do consider myself to be a, an optimist. Um, and I, I, I think, actually, particularly at early stages of education, I, I would hope teachers were optimistic, sort of looking at the child's ability, because uh, we know that there's less variance, actually, in ability than, than, maybe, uh, than, than maybe there is in attainment. Um, so do you think that uh, just looking at these narrow aspects um, and looking solely at, at current attainments enough, or do you think that part of that teacher judgment uh, that maybe a, a standardised assessment wouldn't pick up at that stage is about looking at what the child's capable of? That's a really interesting question. I think um, that, that's the distinguish between potential and the point at which somebody has reached. I, it, ultimately, I don't think it is possible to distinguish between so-called formative and, 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 and um, substantive judgment or final judgment. Um, I think these two things, as Louise has already said, always happen. So in order to know what it is best to help a child with at age five, you need to know in a summative way, in a final way, what they already know, and that's a judgment. You, know, you can't get away from a judgment as a, as, as a precursor to helping the child to progress. Um, so judgment is not a bad thing. Judgment is actually absolutely intrinsic to good teaching, it seems to me. So a teacher then has to be optimistic that they can take the child forward. But in order to be optimistic, they need to have reliable evidence. There is no point in being optimistic on the basis of fallible evidence, of ev evidence that is wishful thinking or something like that, because then you don't help at all. That goes back to the common accusation that children only ultimately suffer if they're praised for trivial things. You should only be praised, according to, for example, to Professor Carl Dweck of California, University, University of California, um, with their ideas of, of, of a growth mindset. You should only be praised for effort, because it's effort that improves what you're going to do. You shouldn't be praised for doing trivial things that don't actually require effort at the stage that you're at as a child. And that will vary according to the age. Anyway, the answer, so that, that would all suggest to me that, that being optimistic is a necessary part of being an effective teacher. 
But being optimistic also requires that one is realistic about the limitations of one's own judgment. And then to be optimistic, you have to be able to listen to judgment that is independent of you as a teacher. And it's only on that basis that you can reliably act. Otherwise, you're living in a, in a, in a, in a potentially in an illusion about what the child can do and therefore what you can help them to do. Um, and just following on from that, do you think, uh, going back to the point I was just making around the, the variability of, of the test, you know, do, do you think they show the teacher you know, enough information to compare that with their own judgment? I'm thinking particularly, um, I've, I've heard from teachers in my own constituency who worry um, you know, that if you can listen to something rather than read it, or uh, that, again, in terms of an individual's child's motivation, perhaps if you showed them you know, two picture cards, you know, they would be more engaged with the test than they are sat on a computer you know, where they're not necessarily very focused. Do you think that those are, you know, those, those are valid points when it comes to the design of these particular They tests? are indeed valid points, and they're the kinds of things that um, the improvement um, a framework of the whole testing regime has built into it. My understanding is that it was always expected that the tests would try to learn from it experience of the first few years especially and try to build an improvement that's happening this year it's already documented for example in the ACER submission and so on um, and so if you take the point there that you mentioned about some children doing better in reading than in listening or vice versa uh, then the fact that the, apart from in primary one the tests do listen do, do, do assess both listening and, and reading as well as writing would mean that a teacher could choose to give greater attention to that aspect of the test than to the, to the other aspect of the test depending on their feeling of what the child is going to respond best to. That's a good example, actually, of where the tests, even though inevitably also, um, as has been said, only assessing certain aspects of the curriculum, are already sufficiently rich to allow that kind of distinction that you mentioned to be drawn. Okay. Thank you. A quick supplementary from Specifically on, on that point about what we're testing each stage. In the, the presentation we got around um, the testing, we were told that a primary one child could interrogate, the, so you have to choose, and you can press a button and hear the word. But in the assessment, the information given to the teacher, there will be no distinction made between a child who has pressed the button and heard it, and the child who has decoded it and read it themselves. What is the value in a test which doesn't make that distinction, it doesn't tell you that what, child, what level a child is operating at? Again, that's a very telling question, and in principle, I would agree that you would want to know that as a teacher. Um, of course, it's an empirical question as to whether it matters. So you could then look at the results. Uh, you would need to have the information. You would need to have the information about whether it was the written form or the oral form that the child was responding to. And then you would have to see whether that was a, that, whether, whether either of these two was a better assessment of the child's overall ability mm -hmm. in language. Um, but with that information, you could take that decision and it might turn out it made no difference or it might turn out it made an enormous amount of difference. That's a, a matter not of the existence of tests, but about the design of the tests. Exactly. And, and that would be an improvement to the design that would seem to me, in principle, to be desirable. Of course, to make it valid and reliable as an improvement, there would then have to be a lot of um, replication of items. You would have to give to some children only oral tests and some only written tests so that you could compare their performance. That kind of thing would have to be done as part of, as it were, an experimental add-on to the annual testing, which would be deliberately an add-on to improve the quality of the whole testing regime. But the point is the test does not show whether the child had to press the button or not. But it could. It, it, it could. It, but it yeah. doesn't show it. No. And so the information you're getting about two children, yes. both children can read that word, mm -hmm. but actually one child needs to hear it, another child doesn't need to hear yeah. it, which is pretty important. I agree. And I wonder whether that means that there is a danger of what looks like standardised testing to give full information is not actually that. Anecdotally, I'm told by people who are very committed teachers, not teachers who mm -hmm. resist, you know, repel all borders, um, but teachers who really want to do their best, yeah. saying it takes 50 hours of teacher time for a primary one class to do the testing, and the information they get is not particularly valuable. Would that be a concern to you if that's people's experience of those tests? But I don't think you can, I suppose my sense is something that's seeking to be objective can't be taken out of the context in which it's operating, and I wonder if you agree with that. Well, if you take the specific point, I, I agree with you entirely that if it would be useful, if it can be shown to be important that whether a child responds to a written version or a heard version, if that can be shown to be important, then it would be important that the test should allow the teacher to distinguish between these two and that the reporting would allow that to happen. Yes, I entirely agree. 
maybe I'm missing something. It seems self-evidently important to Nothing. know. I mean, it may be a child, for example, can read it, can decode it, and, t and presses the button just to reassure themselves. Mm -hmm. Another child can't decode it, but knows that in pressing the button, that will help them. Yes. These are the two different skill sets that have been assessed. Surely it's self-evidently that. Teachers would, would, well, maybe teachers would be able to do this anyway without a standardised yeah. test. So maybe we're, we're digging ourselves into something that's not that important. What struck me about it was something that presented itself to the teacher as rigorous, in my view, wasn't actually particularly rigorous because it was conflating two groups of children together um, or was giving us less information that you might be able to um, identify within a classroom and working with a child? Nothing is self-evident. Any claim that a certain thing is or is not the case needs to be tested by evidence. It could be that if tested, that is, if, if we set up an experiment in which we compared the children's responses on these different ways, oral and written, then we would find that the distinction was so important that the two types of thing had to be reported separately, exactly as you say. But it could be that one predicts the other so reliably that you don't have to have the two separate versions. That's an empirical question that requires evidence to be able to satisfy. But if it turns out that the two things are sufficiently independent that they need to be reported separately, then indeed that evidence would say they need to be reported separately, as you say. Would you share my concern that there appears to be no evidence that questions even been asked about whether this you know, these two different approaches actually matter. Well, that would be a very I mean, constructive... If, 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 this, if the standard assessment is supposed to be based on evidence, yes. we presume we could identify evidence that showed it didn't make any difference whether you asked the question this way or that way with access to being able to hear the word or not. Well, that's presumably the kind of very constructive recommendation that the committee might make. That's, that's the point of trying to have these debates, both the present debate at this committee and also the the new inquiry from the government on P1 testing is to come up with constructive ways of improving the quality of the design of the system and of the reporting of the system. It doesn't damn the system. It says this is a way that it might improve and you might recommend that you should do that in order to see if it can it, improve it. it. But it may call into question some of the assertions that are made around the benefits of the testing if that basic work hasn't been done before they get put in place. Well, that's the past. To improve for the future, to move forward from where we are, getting evidence relating to these really important points. I agree entirely, they're very important points that you're making. Evidence in relation to that would allow improvement of the system to happen. It doesn't damn the system. It doesn't in itself say we shouldn't have the system. It says this might be a very reasonable way in which we could collect evidence to see if we could improve the system in, ex in the way that you recommend. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I know Mr. Mandel wants to come back in, but just before that, do Dr. Bloomer, you said earlier on um, about the information for teachers about the pathways that a, a child would... Is, is this the kind of example of, of the pathways or, or is there an, am I missing something? Is there something else that would be involved in a, a different pathway for a child to achieve a particular level? I think the instance um, that Joanne Lamont is referring to could be an example of where children would be taking different pathways. I mean, the the notion of the pathways is that the test responds to what it gets back from the young person and makes things easier or more difficult to put it crudely so uh, and it also has built in this facility to um, uh, listen to the question as opposed to to reading the question um, so these are examples of the pathway in, in in action the particular example i would have thought um it depends very much on what the question is designed to test. I mean, it is quite conceivable to have a question that is concerned with comprehension, where it is not terribly important whether the child got the question orally or by reading. Self-evidently, however, if the question is trying to assess the individual's ability to read, then um, the question of whether they read it or had it read to them is, is critically important. I cannot imagine that uh, a feeling as obvious as that is built in, into the system, however. Thank you. Just very briefly. The question briefly. was, which word sounds like this word? So the word was, say, pi. Which of these three words sounds like pi? So... Is there a difference if between that is the example, that and reading it? If that's the example, then I'm obliged to agree with you. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, uh, Mr. Mandel. You know, I, I would just say that I mean there are multiple similar examples in in the questions. Uh, you know, to, to, to things like that. You know, where again there's choices between uh, looking at looking at pictures or or reading words, and obviously seeing something 
um, and, you know, and reading a word or, or, or different skills. I wanted to go back oh, to uh, Professor Patterson's point um, you know, around evidence base. For, for these sort of tests, do you need you know, bespoke sort of evidence and, and, and trials, or can you look to other educational research? Because there's plenty of existing educational research out there around how, how, how learning uh, happens, you know, where, where people do look at different different skills and, and, and you know different uh, techniques for reading because again you know someone who's got a wide vocabulary and can see a whole word you know and identify it is again different from, from someone who's able to, to decode um, or, you know or read new words and you know there's plenty of, of evidence out there on, on, on how these different skills work can that be used to inform how tests are designed yes it should it can and it should be uh, professor sue ellis described some of the ways in which that can happen um, and she probably knows better than anybody in scotland on that body of research um, so absolutely agree and, and very much supporting john lament's point there i think that what would be required would be well-designed research into how this operates but in fact that well-designed research has probably already happened if not in scotland then certainly in in other places that have got similar kinds of culture and education system such as England, for example. So you wouldn't want to reinvent the wheel. Scotland's terribly bad at not learning from elsewhere, and we should certainly learn from research elsewhere to inform the kind of questions that, that Joanne Lamont has been asking there. And I, I know you want to look to the future and not go back, but in terms of the future of introducing new things and mm. uh, taking forward new policies, do you not think those are questions that should be asked before any uh, new educational policy yes. is introduced? What is the evidence base? Yes. Um, and, 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 and does what we're doing match up with, yeah, with, with, with educational evidence? Completely agree, and, and without wanting to go back, but for the future, yes, we should be looking far more. And this is not just because an academic will ask for people to pay attention to academic research. It's not that. It's about... It's because it's not just academic research, actually. It's also, for example, the what you might call the accumulated wisdom of the professionals in the system, as often very well articulated by bodies such as the GTC or the AIS or other professional bodies as appropriate. And that, that kind of thing, I think, should be much more part of the um, what you might call the policy formation cycle. That, after all, was one of the aspirations 20 years ago when the standing orders uh, of this place were constructed. And it would be nice if that was done more than just by the necessary um, consultative memorandum attached to the beginning of bills. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Ms. Smith. Good morning, panel. Um, could I ask a very direct question as to whether you believe, in light of what you have uh, said to the committee this morning, as to whether greater standardisation uh, would be helpful specifically in asking schools to undertake the tests at a specific point in the year, um, or whether you think uh, that we should be slightly more open-ended about it? it well, I start that. Um, there's two types of answer to that question. If I answer as a researcher, or as if I was working in the government statistical service or something like that, I would answer there has to be as much standardization as possible. And falling short of that, there has to be collecting of sufficient information to allow an estimate of the effects of not standardizing. So, for example, the precise date at which people were, children were tested. That's, that's the researcher's um, or the civil servant's answer. Of course, I completely recognize that the political answer to that cannot be that, and it goes back to the point that Keir made earlier on, which is that the purpose of the tests have shifted. And insofar as the purpose is now much more firmly, the evidence, the, the emphasis is much more firmly placed on the diagnostic value of the tests, then it would be impossible in these circumstances that have now come about in the last two years to require that the tests take place at a standard time of the year. Um, now, that's a real dilemma, um, and I think that researchers that tr tried to insist on standardisation flying in the face of the, the political reality of it being impossible to have a standardised week in May or whenever uh, would just be failing to pay attention to the reality of how things happen in the real world. So my compromise would indeed be the caveat I made to the first point. We cannot hold them in May in a single week or November in a single week. But what we can do is collect information that allow us to take account of the possible effects of maturation on, the, on, 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 on the, for example, the difference between the autumn and the spring of primary one. Um, point uh, about the dilemma, which I think is a very important one. I mean, if you are a parent, I think you're interested in two things. Firstly, how is my child getting on at school? What progress uh, is he or she making? But secondly, you're interested in how well is the school doing? And it seems to me at the moment that we have relatively good information 
available on how well a child is doing and the, the new tests are designed to provide greater information uh, to teachers on that basis. I think we're more or less agreed on that. But the new tests are also designed to provide greater information to local authorities and the Scottish Government to assess how well schools are doing and therefore to be able to pinpoint areas of concern. In other words, if there are schools and or local authorities where the educational standards year on year are not as good as perhaps they should be, it's that aspect that we need to find the relevant data for. Because if we don't find that, it's very difficult to help these um, local authorities or schools who are slightly underperforming to improve. C could you be very specific about what additional data you think we need, or perhaps better interpret the existing data, to find out where there are weaknesses in the system and therefore to help um, schools that are underperforming? There is a very real danger, I think, <coughs> of overgeneralising in the sense of saying that um, an instrument which is designed to um, collect information on very specific aspects of, um, of reading and writing, for example, and, and number, can be generalised to the quality of a school. So that's one issue. The second issue is that... Um, but there are three issues. The second issue is that um, by, with the phrase stand, standardised assessment um, is, is one way of collecting information and it can be an important and a helpful um, source of evidence to inform a broader judgment. The tension always is that um, not to use that in a way where it can have unintended consequences on other activities. So that um, if, for example, schools see that the test is taken on one particular week in the year and all the children are to it, then actually a, an atmosphere develops around that where it starts to attract stakes that um, nobody wants it to have. Um, and I think we have evidence in our, well, we have anecdotal evidence in our system just now that in certain circumstances that kind of thing has been happening. So these all take place within a context. The third issue is that uh, and we want to make sure that the consequences that follow from the use of any assessment, that these consequences are positive consequences. And the third issue is that um, this um, assessment is not the only part of the education system. It is the responsibility of education authorities to make sure that the quality of education within schools is um, of an appropriate standard. And so quality assurance officers, school inspectors, we have lots of other sources of information that come together in order to give a picture of um, the performance in a particular school. So I think it's recognising that we have multiple sources of evidence in the system and making sure that when we ask key questions that we draw on a range of sources of evidence in order to give us uh, a dependable answer to a question. In, in that case, do you believe that there's work to be done with the uh, school inspection process to enhance that qualitative judgment? I think that the school inspection system is one part of our national improvement framework that is a way of gathering evidence on what happens within a schools within a, within schools. You know, local authorities have their own um, quality assurance processes. We have a national self evaluation system that is moderated by critical friends coming into so that you know. We have a great deal of evidence in the system, and if we focus only on one tiny element of it, then we risk ending up with a less dependable judgment than we may have had if we paid attention to the range of sources of evidence that we have available to us. That's a very interesting uh, point that you raise. I I'm just trying to get at the situation where if there are variable standards uh, across local authorities, particularly within local authorities, where some uh, schools, even who uh, might have improved on their own performance uh, over time, which I think is a very important, in fact, I think that's one of the most important uh, trends is to measure a school against itself, actually. How, how do we get to a satisfactory measure for a director of education uh, in a local authority or a Scottish government minister 
if there are concerns about the, um, the flat lining of performance in that particular local authority area? How do, how do we drill down on these results and make some, uh, as you say, it's in the national improvement framework to try to help them to improve what they're doing? I think that um, going back to a conversation we had earlier, which is about the interrelationship of research policy and practice within the, within the system, that um, often the, the truth is that when issues like that happen, we don't know why. So we have to ask further questions. What is it that is going on in a particular establishment that is leading to this particular situation? So it's a trigger to seek further evidence relating then to action. Um, and I think it's that kind of seeing it at a whole systems level and thinking about what evidence do we need to collect that will give us the best quality information that is likely to lead to improvement. Interestingly, the research evidence sorry, suggests that um, most, um, in most circumstances, the differences between schools are largely explained in terms of socioeconomic circumstances. Um, the most significant differences lie within schools. Okay, could I just finish uh, my question to uh, Dr. Bloomer? Um, the Royal Society at the time where it produced its report about the Curriculum for Excellence and the, how to measure uh, the Curriculum for Excellence pointed up uh, quite a few uh, gaps in the information and the, the available uh, research that we can um, use to uh, draw conclusions about that. It also pointed to some international evidence that suggested that Scotland could learn and to pick up the point that Professor Patterson made that we're not very good at learning from international uh, comparisons. I, is there, are we talking about additional information that we need uh, in Scotland to um, improve our own efforts to uh, close the attainment gap? Or is it a matter of interpreting the data that we already have? The Royal Society of Edinburgh believes that Scottish education is relatively data poor and that we need more information than we've got at the present moment, particularly uh, at stages beyond, sorry, below the, uh, the senior phase in, in secondary education. I, I think we would all, at this end of the table, hope that the work that your committee is engaged in at the moment will make some kind of contribution towards improving uh, the information gathering that is going on in the... Um, Scottish education system. Uh, some parts of that, no doubt, are beyond the remit that you've taken on for yourselves. I mean, uh, we are now involved in only one international survey. That, in my view, was a mistake to abandon the other two. I hope that at some point it will be reversed. We do need more information about how we compare with other countries. And uh, although PISA is an excellent survey, uh, it operates at age 15, so it tells us nothing really about what is happening at those stages of the education system about which we are already most ignorant. Now, as I say, I th suspect that's not the kind of issue that you're immediately concerned with. But you are concerned with the assessment regime, and therefore I think by implication you're concerned with the question of whether we would benefit from having something like SSA or SSLN uh, reinstated. I, mean, I don't know that I'm entitled to speak for my, my colleagues, but I rather think that the three of us think that that would be a good thing to do. Um, and whether that happens or not, um, I'm sure that we all think that it's important to be clear about what information it is that you think that the national standardised assessments are supposed to be generating. Now, it is possible, of course, uh, to use a single assessment in order to generate information of more than one kind, although you have to be careful about whether one is compromising the other, if that is, if that is what you do. Uh, so it may not be necessary to say it only serves one purpose, but it is, I think, necessary to be clear about what the hierarchy of purposes is. I mean, either it is uh, an assessment designed to monitor the performance of the system, in which case, what it generates by way of diagnostic information is secondary. Or alternatively, it is a tool that is about uh, assisting 
teach us to aid individual young people and also to refocus their teaching so as to benefit from what they learn about how their whole class is getting on, in which case its performance as a, a source of evidence about the system as a whole is secondary. But we need to know which it is and then to act accordingly. And if it is primarily about generating information about the system, then uh, it needs to be able to fulfil that purpose, which I think would point in the direction of greater standardisation of, of approaches. If it is about uh, diagnostic uh, uh, purposes, then that is not important. So it's a question of clarity about objectives, first of all, and the rest follows from that. Can I come in again on the question about individual schools? Because I think Keir's put very graphically the distinction between national assessing the system as a whole nationally, possibly also at local authority level, and the other purposes that this can be put to. And you asked questions about the what 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 could a local authority um, director of education do about knowledge about individual schools on the basis of this? Now there is a workable model, unfortunately now moved away from in England, which um, operated until I think about four years ago called contextual value added, and there were two components of that. One was that in looking at a school, you would be looking at what it adds to children's learning. It's not saying the number of, you know, take at the end of secondary school, it's not the number of hires that this, the school on average gets, but it's the progress that this, the school has enabled children to make towards the hires. And that's the basis, for example, of some of the contextual admissions decisions that universities are making. So that's one thing. It's about progress at primary as well as at secondary. It's about progress that the children make. But the contextual bit of that method in England was taking account also of the social circumstances that the children were living in too. Because we sometimes think of, um, as it were, parental social class or parental education as a kind of background variable that you allow for once. But it's not. The, the, if, if your parents can help you because their own education is advanced, then that continues to be a help right through. So the child who's got well-educated parents is likely to make more progress between, say, P1 and P4 than the child who, whose parents are not so well-educated. So that's why the contextual bit. Now, after a lot of argument between about the mid-19s 1990s and about the middle part of the last decade, there was a system that by and large commanded quite a lot of consensus in England, which was put in place, I can't remember exactly when it was, but it was sometime in the last decade, and then ran until a few years ago. Um, and it certainly ran right through the period of coalition for government, for example, and that some of the policy decisions had been taken under the previous Labour government. Um, now, these, th that worked quite well. It wasn't perfect, but it did allow both level school level information to be generated, but at the same time also taking account of the complexities of children's learning, both in terms of the progress and of the, the family and other circumstances that they face. So there might be some possibility of using the SNSAs in that way. I should finish by saying that school level information is bound to find its way into the public domain, whether we want it or not, because of freedom of information. So it would be far better to prepare for that by addressing the kind of questions that you've raised. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Scott? Yeah, just, yeah. I just so agree with that last point, um, but that's a different argument altogether. Uh, can I just ask on Liz Smith's line of questioning, the achievement of CFE levels return, uh, which the government said in their submission to us that uh, is a replacement for the SSLN. Uh, a, do you think it is a replacement? And B, uh, do, it obviously we're not quite sure it works at all because they indeed badge it as, I think, still experimental even after three years. What's, what's its role? What, what do you think it's there for? Well, I, perhaps, I, I, I don't think it's an adequate substitute for SSLN no. um, for two major reasons. Uh, one is that the assessment levels, the, the assessment of where the children have reached is, is in terms of teacher judgments, and we've talked about the unreliability of these already. Um, secondly, um, it's not an adequate substitute for a completely different reason, which is the measurement of social circumstances. Now, actually, the SSLN suffered from that too. Um, and we need much better measures of the social circumstances. The, the, the committee, I think, has addressed this point before, and it's coming up over and over again. We know, for example, that two-thirds of children living in poverty are not in the neighbourhoods, the 20% most deprived neighbourhoods. I mean, yeah. Your constituency yeah. has no deprived neighbourhoods, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> See, and, and that doesn't mean it's got no deprived families. So that these kinds of things are... Th there are other ways in which the, the annual December report is inadequate, but these are the two major ways. Yeah. Yes. So that supports the contention that we should 
revisit SSLN, hmm. but with some enhancements yes. and some careful creative thought right. about how it should properly yes. work. And, and we, we have good models of that. The Growing Up in Scotland survey, which is an absolutely excellent survey, um, which traces children through. I mean, it, 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 it contains really good sensitive measures. And I'm not saying we replicate that every year, it would be too expensive. But the experience that that um, Scott Sen and in particular Paul Bradshaw, who is the director of the survey, have built up over the last um, 15 years, I think, since the survey was established, would be really useful in helping to strengthen the evidence that you're talking about. Yeah. And on the point, thank you, and on the point that you've all made about, I don't think Kay Bloomer particularly said, we, all of us in politics would be basing our arguments on some pretty thin evidence on closing the attainment gap if we are where we are. Mm -hmm. Would an enhanced SSLN potentially help politicians of all political persuasions with what is genuinely a difficult issue. Do you think that uh, there's some purpose in it in that sense too? Is that yes. Fair to say? Yeah. I think it's designed to serve that purpose. Yeah. So it's the biggest question why we took it away. Mm. Yeah. But then you've answered that already. So. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms Mackay? Um, yes, just to, I'd like to just sort of go back to the purpose and to, to go back to some comments Dr Bloomer made a few moments ago. Um, if I was explaining standardised standardized assessments to a constituent and I said they were there to monitor the performance of the system, I think they'd be surprised and confused because they, they think that they're there to monitor the performance of their child. Do you think there's been something lost in translation when we've been getting this over to the public? I'm not suggesting this is any, in any way your responsibility. Um, that they are confused, that is the, the general perception? That the, the, their, their diagnostic test, essentially. Has changed. Um, and as a result, uh, parents have been persuaded that the primary purpose is diagnostic. Mm -hmm. That was certainly not the advertised primary purpose at the outset. The the others have a... From the National Parent Forum submission, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, which I think puts it really succinctly and well. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Right. Okay. But also I think that um, policy also should be um, susceptible to development in the light of evidence. And that, so I think, I don't know if we would all disagree, but I would argue that the, the, that shift to having the, the tests um, to lower the stakes, to have them as, as part of what it, the repertoire that a teacher can draw on, is a positive move. So but you it think then leaves a gap. They should be used, <laughs> which is why. Sorry, sorry, yeah. <laughs> yes, but, so, it's, but it's why then we're talking about um, how that gap might be, might be addressed uh -huh. in a way that would not have the kinds of hmm. potential unintended consequences that, had the policy stayed as it was, could, mm -hmm. have, could have brought with it. Yeah. So you, you, you believe it could do with some clarification from the public's point of view about the purpose of these tests? Yeah. Okay. I think also once, once, sorry, once, the, um, once parents start getting report cards that incorporate the results of the tests, yeah. then I think the misunderstanding will go away. Yeah. And in fact, it would be very difficult then for the government or MD else to go back on that. Once parents start getting the kind of scale thing that has already been published, I think, on the Education Scotland website, and it's in the ACER submission, um, then parents are going to think, why did we not get this kind of detailed information before? And I think the problems then may, that face teachers might be quite different is how to explain the sorts of things that Louise has been talking about, which is that the child's progress is more than just the result of the test. Sure, thank you. If I could just ask uh, Professor Hayward, you, you, you said that um, the system is, is, a, is a modelled layer coming from local authority down. Do you think that's actually working in practice or is, or is it too early to, to tell at the moment? I think that um, like any complex system, there are parts of our system that, that work very well and there are parts of our system that work less well. I think that um, at a system, lear learning from evidence is as important at the level of the system as it is at the level of the child. So it's um, making sure that we have um, good quality evidence that will allow us to reflect on the really helpful question that you raise um, and then will allow us to, to, to realign policy. So in, again, going back to the question that came up earlier, there's, there's, I think there is the idea of research to inform. So there's research which along with other sources of dependable evidence, professional uh, evidence from teachers and classrooms, evidence from school inspectors, evidence, you know, a whole series of evidence that should inform any new development. But also, I think it's also about research to align. It's once we've got the vision of what it is that we want to achieve, then actually keeping an eye on what's happening as it's developing. 
so that we make sure that we stay consistent to the ideas of the vision. Because our history, in common with the history of every country that I've worked with internationally, is that very often um, countries start out with very clear and very coherent visions of what they want to achieve. But over time, the divergence happens. And because that we don't actually go into the system to try to better understand why these gaps are beginning to emerge, it continues to develop until we get to a point where a new innovation has to come in. And I think it's changing that model to say we have a vision of what we want to achieve and using research evidence as we develop in order to make sure that we remain consistent with that vision. And we feed the evidence from that back into developments, both in terms of practice, but also perhaps in terms of policy. Okay, thank you, that's helpful. Yeah, I have one point, thank you. Um, while I agree with Lindsay that uh, parents will be a bit clearer once they begin to receive uh, test feedback in school reports, I'm not sure that they will necessarily all be well equipped to interpret what they are told. Uh, what they will be told is, in relation to each test, for example, the reading test, what band of 12 uh, their particular child was considered to sit in. And they will be offered uh, a paragraph of three or four lines length, uh, a completely standard uh, pre-written paragraph um, that tells them something about the band. Each of these descriptors starts with the word, learners in this band are typically able to, and then it says something like, read a wide range of straightforward texts or whatever. So what this is saying is that typically, uh, a child who falls in band six, for example, is able to do this, but not perhaps that. Um, whether the individual child of that parent uh, fits the typical stereotype of the band descriptor is, of course, another matter. And as we have already discussed, um, you can get to being assessed as band six by answering a different set of questions from somebody else who ends up being considered to be uh, band six. And obviously, of course, a different mix of skills might have emerged in the answers that you give. So um, it adds information to the parent's understanding, but there are limitations to the nature of the information that it adds. Yes, Professor Pratt. About the design, because um, yes, different children will get different questions, but if the design of the tests has been done adequately scientifically, then they will be addressing the same underlying skills. I mean, most people would be aware that if they go to um, their doctor and they get a blood, uh, a blood pressure test taken and it's showing something unusual, that the doctor will almost certainly, or should not, rely just on that one assessment because the person has probably gone in some apprehension. Maybe they've started, traveled by ScotRail so they've been late and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> um, and so they will, they will repeat the test. Um, so people are aware, people are, every, we, all of it, we all know about the essential randomness of things and what is not being conveyed, and this is a real failing, it seems to me, of the public discourse around this, which is that all assessment is subject to random error. Um, now, there's been some detailed studies of that in England, and that degree of random error has very much diminished compared with 20 years ago when the national curriculum assessments in England were first introduced. But there's still an inevitable amount of random error that's still there, and we still have got some way to go. That, that's what the purposes of the, of the so-called reliability measures are in the new standardised assessments. They're pretty high, but they're not perfect, and there's a degree of misclassification going to go on. Now, that's not because... MD's doing the test badly or because the teachers are failing to understand them or anything like that. It's just because it's intrinsic to the nature of measurement that it's got an element of error introduced. And there needs to be some education programme around that. Um, and that's difficult. Um, and it, 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 it involves acknowledging that there are mistakes, not deliberate biases, but random mistakes that are made. And I think that the challenge, therefore, to educate parents and what to do with these results is going to be very, very great indeed. And I don't see any programme from any agency at the moment intending to educate parents about this, sadly. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ms. Gilruth. Thank you, convener. Um, I'd like to just turn to um, 
I think, Lindsay Patterson, you alluded at the start to this bias and objectivity, and you've spoken about it again there. And um, you said that no teacher is objective. And certainly when I was teaching, um, we used to be able to identify where certain pupils came from. Um, a certain primary school uh, in the city actually used to inflate grades. So we, we knew um, that that happened in the system. Um, and Professor Sue Ellis, in a, a previous evidence session, made the point that the SNSAs could challenge unethical and perhaps biased approaches to assessment itself, um, whereby children are removed from class, for example, in groups. And I wonder if the panel would agree with that assertion that the SNAs could potentially stop that kind of thing from happening. If it, if it, if it helps to induce a, a mindset amongst everybody involved that, that if you're going to get properly reliable evidence, then you have to adhere to standardised conditions in the same way as any scientist or any doctor or MD would want to do to get reliable evidence. You can't, as it were, um, fix the results by s fixing the conditions under which the results are obtained. So, yeah, that would be a really good thing. The rest of the panel? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And secondly, then, Professor Hayward, um, you gave an example earlier on, I think, with regard to moderation and quality assurance at Education Scotland. You spoke of teachers working collaboratively to get a better understanding of standards. And I wonder then if the SNSC offers the same opportunities for teachers to work uh, collaboratively to get a better understanding of CFE levels. Uh, I mean, I think, Lindsay Patterson, you talked about the accumulated wisdom of the profession. Could there be an opportunity to improve that as a result of the SNSCs? I suppose that um, it, it's back to a point I made earlier that the, the SNSAs give you information about very limited areas of um, the... So, for example, one assumes the purpose of um, the, being a teacher, as you were in the classroom, is to help children to uh, become better readers. And in that, that sort of context, for example, so... Um, the SSNA will give you information um, on aspects of that, but also as a teacher you know that um, the motivation, um, whether a child believes that they can read, whether they see reading as being important, that these are all crucial factors in whether or not a child will make progress in reading. And it's that bringing together of, it, it's living with that complexity and focusing on I would argue that parents also want to know, what can I do to help my child next? What's my child moving on to? What are the most important things that they focus on? So the SSNA can play a role within that broader picture, but it is, it is the quality of the teacher, their understanding of the curriculum, and their, their ability to generate tasks and experiences for young people that will allow them to develop as positively as they can, and then their ability to discern progress and focus on what happens next in learning. It's a complex picture, and we have to learn to live with that complexity and support that complexity if we really are concerned to improve the life chances of every child in Scotland. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ms Lamont? Yeah. Um, thank you very much. Some of the questions I had about um, I think what Professor Patterson called neutral and reliable, maybe I've been ready to discuss, but is it, would it be fair to say that a test that can be applied at any point between a child being four and a half and six with a lot of support and practice, as I was, we were advised at the, um, um, the demonstrations or not any practice, will distort the information that the, the classroom teacher is getting? If the purpose is, as it now appears to be, to give the teacher diagnostic information about how to help the child to make further progress, then I would say the risk is not too great because the teacher has already taken into account the fact that they've chosen to test that child at age six, perhaps in the summer of uh, the age worked out that way, summer of P1, um, rather than earlier. So that, that wouldn't be a problem. It is a, where it is a problem, and I said in answer to Liz Smith's question, is in trying to aggregate these results to make interpretations about the system as a whole or the local authority or the school. And I would say that um, if that's happening to an extent that we don't know about, then it actually comes close to invalidating the results when aggregated to these levels. Okay. I suppose the other thing I'm interested in is within the system, where does this pr process lie in terms of being important? I'll give an example. When I was still a classroom teacher, S1 English class, you had to say some maybe in October, it's going to be a parents' night, you give an initial idea of how the kids are doing, progress, behaviour, homework, effort. And I would 
want to give all of them A's because basically they come in, they're really enthusiastic, they're really keen, they're in a new school, they're doing their very best. And I was told by the head teacher I could only give 20% A's because after all, by the time they got to hire, only 20% of them were able to compete. But in fact, by giving a child an A and recognising what they've been trying to do, you're keeping them engaged in school. So it's an entirely valid thing for a professional to do to say, I want to keep these wee people enthusiastic. I'm not going to tell them now, by the way, you're not going to get a hire. Do you accept that that is part of the assessment? Perhaps objective testing allows the teacher to know both what they want and aspire for the child, what they want for themselves against the testing. First of all, do you think um, that that is valid? But secondly, if it could be established, we, we talk about not teaching to the test, but if it's established that in schools, support staff have been taken away from children with additional support needs in order to manage the process, which would disproportionately impact in schools with disproportionately high numbers of children with additional support needs, should that affect, would that be, does that matter? Is that a judgment in the effectiveness of the policy of a standardised assessment test? So I'm being told anecdotally that what's happening in a primary school with a lot of children with additional support needs, the support staff have been taken to run the system. Is that not another form of distortion, which is the same as teaching to the test? Well, that, that is a serious failure in so many respects. I don't need to be pointed out, but the, the answer to that would be it completely contradicts the idea that the purpose of the test is to inform the teacher's judgment, because the teacher, as it were, can't subcontract their judgment. They have to hone their judgment on the test that they, as a teacher, administer. Um, so that's a, but that's not a consequence of the test. It's a consequence of the school management um, and of but the local authority management. if it's a consequence of a compulsory nature of the test in a school which does not have the resources to do anything other than manage it in that way? Well, it might be a consequence of the ways in which the tests are implemented by government as well as by the school and the local authority, but it's not a consequence of testing as such. It's a consequence of the context of the, of the testing. But if we go back to the point you made about your... Um, your head teacher with the, his normal distribution, maybe it was her normal distribution, in mind, I suspect, um, not that actually that was nonsense and that should never happen. And you know, clearly we shouldn't ever constrain people by completely non-evidence-based standards. And that's the point. Um, if you wanted to give A's to everyone for the purposes of encouraging them, then that's fine. But it doesn't produce a judgment. It's a form of exhortation. It's what the, presumably the team coach does at the beginning of a football match or something like that. It's got nothing to do with actual performance. But after the match, the team coach would presumably want to say that you did well and you didn't do well and you didn't try hard enough. And that, that would be the point, because that would be based on, on evidence. And if the whole system of national assessments encourages a greater respect for evidence in making these assessments and judgments across the system as a, of Scotland, Scottish education as a whole, then that would be a good thing, because people would no longer get mixed up between exhortation and assessment. Mm -hmm. Would it be valid, though, in assessing the benefit of standardised assessments to ask schools what the consequence has been on the routine processes that are going through? I mean, I am troubled by the fact that you know, we were told in the demonstration that a child could be basically tutored on how to run. They've got any number of chances to, to practice the test before they do it, which must distort what's happening in the classroom in terms of time. So that, that, that was part of the, the practice sessions that the children would have. I don't think it's part of the actual assessment itself. But nevertheless, no, but you if, you, if, you, if you haven't got a standardised test, mm -hmm. you don't have to practice the test before you do it, self-evidently. Mm. So, and some schools may make the judgment in the way that you know, the old um, survey was. You go, you do it, you come back. It's not really got anything to do immediately about the individual impact on you as a learner. But teaching to the test is only a bad thing if the test is bad, if the test isn't a valid assessment of the content of the curriculum. If, the, if, if there's going to be lots of teaching to the test, then we'd better, which there will be, then we'd better make sure that the tests are valid. That is, that they're actually assessing what's in the curriculum. So, for example, in primary one, we're expecting children to tell the time from analogue devices, not just digital things. Now, if that's a reasonable thing to have in the curriculum, then it's a reasonable thing to ask them to perform. It's not an unreasonable task at all to ask them to look at an analogue clock. It might be unreasonable at primary one to look, ask them to look at Roman numerals in an analogue clock, but that's not the point. It's about interpreting the position of the hands. So in other words, there is, it's, this is not either... The, 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 the teaching to the test mantra is overused, I think, and sometimes teaching the test to the test can actually be a good discipline that forces people to think. After all, we expect... Um, people 
in um, higher mathematics um, to have been taught to the test to the extent that they learn how to perform mathematical operations. Indeed, if we go back again to primary school, I mean, it is true that, of course, the tests, as has been frequently said this morning, test only certain aspects of attainment. But these aspects are actually, in some respects, fundamentally important before any other progress can be made. Unless a child can actually do the elementary operations of arithmetic, they will never make progress in any other aspect, not only of maths, but of science and in many aspects of social science as well. So checking that the child can add and subtract and multiply and divide and can do that mentally as well as on paper, although a apparently very narrow, is actually the basis for the child flourishing in later life. So teaching the test is not necessarily a bad thing. It depends on what the test is doing. Mm -hmm. I, I would agree with that. Yeah. Sorry, I think, I, I think um, uh, Ms. Lamott raises also some very interesting issues about the, the relationship between, again, if the focus is, the focus is learning. You know, if as an English teacher, what you wanted to do was to encourage someone to learn, then a system that asks you to put a label on that learning isn't necessarily the, the, the most helpful way to do that. You know, it's what can that child do now? What does your understanding as an English teacher in terms of the progression of the learning journey from the time the child walks into the school until the time they're likely to leave? How does the, the child that you're working with relate to that learning journey? And then how might you support them to make progress on that journey is, is absolutely crucial. I mean, it's interesting that um, in Norway, for example, that it is, um, it is illegal, it is written into law that you cannot put a letter or uh, a number against a child's name um, before, I think, they're 12. So in that context, it's you know, a recognition that actually using letters or numbers, which are shorthand symbols for professionals, and also shorthand symbols intended to communicate with people externally, actually can have a negative effect on the self-esteem and the confidence of the very young people that you want um, to support most effectively. And there's a confusion, I think, sometimes in people's minds between, um, uh, between criterion referencing. So, you know, having a, having a, a criterion and then you, you look at the child's progress in relation to, to the criterion and the development. Um, as opposed to norm referencing, you know, where you're looking at the 20% who can, or you're looking at the... And so I think I would make a plea, not just for better understanding um, about standardised testing, but actually, as a society, um, better understanding about assessment and the, its potential to enhance learning, um, but also the real challenges that it can set up for us um, in trying to achieve a society where every child um, makes really good progress. Louise's point there about norm and criterion referencing uh, is an interesting one. If you want um, a well-rounded and comprehensive picture of how a young person is developing intellectually, ask the teacher. Um, and that has always been true, and I think remains true. Um, very few classroom teachers, particularly if they're operating in primary and have got the whole, more or less, the whole week with the child, would have any difficulty in, off the top of their heads, giving you some kind of norm referencing of all of the children in their class, whether it was for reading or for uh, arithmetic or whatever. How that related to how children elsewhere in the country are performing is an entirely different matter. So if you want a criterion referenced assessment, probably don't go to the class teacher. The information that you would get from the standardised assessment will be more helpful to you at any rate in relation to the limited part of the curriculum uh, that it covers. We have in recent years become much more interested in how teachers' judgment um, correlates with some more objective notion of expectations and standards. Hence the emphasis that has been placed on moderation that was talked about uh, earlier on. And uh, the, the new assessments do provide teachers with a tool that will help them to do some of that. And that is uh, quite a valuable contribution. Okay, thank you. Um, finally, Mr Greer. 
Thank you. Um, it's just to, to return to the, the issues raised around the, the comparability of, of the data um, and the point that uh, Jan Lamont raised that you will have some children taking these tests in primary one at four and a half and some at uh, six years old and the significant difference between them. Uh, just to, to clarify, Professor Patterson, um, did I pick you up correctly earlier on um, when you said that uh, the aggregate data, group level uh, data at that stage, if that variability is not recognised, it would invalidate the data? Um, yeah, as a simple headline, yes. I would say it would invalidate it. It's too big a variation at that age. Um, I mean, it's not, this is a dependent thing. Obviously, I've got students who vary in that age more than that age <laughs> um, uh, at doing their final honours exam, and we don't apply an age adjustment. So, so clearly, it varies. But at that age, certainly, at that very young age, it would be, you couldn't draw, I think, it would be safe to say, valid inferences if you just have the test result and no measure at all about progress um, on the basis of that. Incidentally, that is an argument for later stages in primary and having baseline testing in primary one, because it does allow you to measure progress, and at least then you can take account of it. But anyway, sorry, I'm, 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 I'm introducing too many caveats. My answer to your question is yes, it would invalidate it. Thanks. Um, and from your experience, um, do you believe that there's a sufficient level of data literacy uh, within local authorities and within schools to recognise and compensate for that? There isn't. And, and one of the reasons there isn't, I mean, it's demonstrable that, that local authorities don't have that statistical expertise. Um, but sadly, it has to be said that the vast majority of Scottish teachers don't have it either. Remember, you can do a primary teaching degree with what's now the equivalent of national five life skills in mathematics. So, sorry, it's now called apply applications of mathematics, which in, for some of us of a certain age used to be called arithmetic O grade. And it was similarly um, standard grade pass, in other words, C, um, and National A5. Now, that is not enough to understand the complexities of statistical sampling and of measures of reliability. And what's more, you might think they would get this in their teacher education programmes, but as was pointed out to you, I think, last year when you had evidence given here by some student teachers, they get no more mathematics in their undergraduate programmes than they took with them from school. They get courses on the teaching of maths, but they don't get any more maths. So the typical primary school graduate is emerging as a new teacher with no more than life skill level, application of mathematics national five. Now that is not nearly enough. So that's the basis on which I say this, that there is not enough evidence, there is not enough expertise to allow the evidence to be interpreted in schools. Thank you. Is that an opinion that other panelists would share? I think that, um, that there may be variance across different um, teacher education institutions. Um, no, the evidence produced from that same session to this committee, as I say, I think it was last year, might be in the session before, there was a paper from the Scottish Government that looked at the amount of time in a typical four-year programme devoted to certain activities, one of which was mathematics. There was variance, but none of it was more than a few hours per week. It wasn't nearly enough. They didn't even get to the level of higher mathematics. There's variance, of course, from one student teacher to another because they're coming in with, uh, uh, yes, uh, with yeah. varying levels of expertise yes. in mathematics. But yes. as we um, place increasing importance on teachers interpreting evidence, this has implications for initial teacher education, which so far are largely unconsidered. One thing that might be said, Finland is often a place rightly admired, and um, one of the questions that's often asked is, why, why does Finland do so well and doesn't have national testing until the end of the primary school and so on? One answer to that question has often been said, I think rightly, that it's got to do with the quality of teacher education. And if you look into detail in what this means is that, for example, I think I'm right in this figure, about 15% of primary school teachers have a degree in mathematics or have, have enough of a component in their teacher degree to have a mathematics qualification. They could teach, they would satisfy our requirements to teach maths in secondary school. Now, on average, that would mean that every primary school had at least one person qualified to the level of the equivalent of a, math, a mathematics honours degree. That doesn't mean that every teacher has to be able to do this, but you would want every school to have somebody who could interpret the evidence and share that interpretation with their, with their colleagues. And the same is true of other areas of specialism within the Finnish you know, foreign languages or Finnish as a language, etc., etc. The only thing I would add to um, what Lindsay has said is that um, in terms of assessment literacy, it's assessment in its broader sense. Mm -hmm. So it isn't, it isn't only yes. about you know, interpreting statistical yeah. evidence. It's the, the broad picture. It's about how assessment relates to curriculum and pedagogy, 
and the, the, the skills that are needed. And it's making sure that in our system and in all the layers, mm. from, from the classroom teacher um, to, um, I don't know what kinds of induction programmes you have when you, you come in to, to work in Parliament, you know, but it's, it, it's the extent to which um, people are supported to carry out the roles mm. that society is asking them to carry out. Um, and it's making sure that that's there right the way through our system. The layer up from uh, schools, looking at local authority level, uh, also there's a, a challenge for, for teachers there in that uh, that level of data literacy is one of many skills that would be desirable in a teacher. At local authority level, you have the opportunity uh, to create posts and to recruit people with the specific skills for these areas. But there's been some evidence that um, local authorities no longer have the quality improvement staff who have that level of, of understanding. Is that something that, that you have picked up, that the introduction of SNSEs and, and the need for local authority level staff with that level of data literacy has come at the same time as local authorities have lost the staff who would have previously had the relevant skills? That is unquestionably the case. And local authorities have a declining capacity to offer support to schools. And so long as local authorities remain an important tier of organisation within the system, that is decidedly unfortunate. Thank you. But also the, the of um, you know, building, building capacity, which is fundamentally what we're talking about, building capacity in the system. Again, I think that, that probably might vary from authority to authority, mm. depending on the size of the, the authority. Um, but the other issue is it's about seeing um, these skills and these competences of part of what it is to be a professional teacher. So it isn't just initial teacher education. No. It's about making sure that throughout a teacher's professional career that there are opportunities for them to develop and hone and enhance their skills in these areas. Thank you. Um, it's been a, a very long session this morning. Um, uh, Dr. Bloomer, Professor Hayward, and Professor Patterson, thank you very much for your attendance at the committee today and also for your submissions, which you'll have heard have been highly valued by the committee members. Um, our next session on Scottish National Standardised Assessments will continue on the 30th of January. I'm going to suspend for five minutes, but remind members we are coming back into public session.
to agenda item three, which is a petition P1694 on free instrumental music services, which are referred to us by the Public Petitions Committee in the course of our inquiry into instrumental music tuition. I'd like to put on record my sincere thanks to all who signed the petition and uh, thanks also from the Music and Education Partnership Group who raised the issue with the committee during our evidence session. And to all of those who gave evidence into our inquiry, including some very powerful contributions from the young people that were involved in our deliberations. An inquiry report was published yesterday and we're hoping to hold a committee debate on the report in the Chamber involving members from across the Parliament in the near future. We will also consider the Government and COSLA's response to our recommendations at a future committee meeting and in addition we will consider how the What's Going On Now research aligns with the committee's findings. The paper suggests closing the petition at this stage or alternatively we could leave it open until we have received the um, correspondence regarding the report from the Scottish Government and COSLA. And on that basis, I'm looking for uh, guidance from the committee as to their preference to hold the um, petition open or to close it today. Yeah. You know, I just wonder if it wouldn't be courteous to keep it open at this time, until such time as both the debates happened and the government and other bodies have responded to the committee's report. I mean, it just struck me from home uh, yesterday, a couple of people actually mentioned the committee report, which it has to be said does not happen every day. Um, so that suggests it struck some kind of chord with people. And I think therefore, given this, it's entirely relevant to the work we've just done, it might be courteous to act in that way. Is anyone else otherwise minded? No, can we content to leave? Leave that open to, to deliberation at a future meeting. Thank you. Our final agenda item this morning is um, the committee to consider further response from COSLA to the inquiry report into the attainment and achievement of school aged children experience poverty. The committee considered the response from the Government and Education Scotland and an initial response from COSLA last year, but the substantive response from COSLA covers issues the committee acknowledged would take longer to analyse and therefore respond to. Uh, on one observation to make for committee members is that the government responded in relation to the committee's recommendation that all local authorities should be surveyed on charges being made for court education and how these charges contribute to the cost of the school day. The government's response said it would pursue these challenges with COSLA. However, the um, recent um, submission from COSLA does not mention the committee's recommendations in this area. Um, so um, it suggests that the committee write to the Scottish Government copying in COSLA, seeking clarification as to which organisation is taking forward the work stemming from this recommendation on the cost of the school day and seek details as to what specific work is planned. Uh, members content to do that? Yeah. Are there any other observations um, from committee members on the response from COSLA? Thank you. So um, that will conclude our public session for this week and I now um, suspend it to private session. Thank you. <laughs>